Hi friends, good morning and welcome to River Church's online worship. I'm so glad you joined us today. We're about to get started. Uh, before uh, we get started, I want to invite you to, to get ready. Uh, we're going to have communion, celebrate communion together in just a few minutes. So go get the, your bread and, and, and your, your juice or, or some kind of some, something to drink. Um, give her distractions. Go get your Bible, something to write with, a pen. Um, maybe uh, go fill up your coffee cup. Uh, it, 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 it's about to get started, so I just want you to get ready. If you have any questions about River Church, uh, you can go online, riverchurchrgv.com, and we've got a virtual calendar. We've got a, all the, a list of all the things going on, uh, how you might get connected, uh, ways to contact me and the other elders. So riverchurchrgv.com, is, it, that's the key. All things River Church can be found there. Okay, well, you get ready, and in just a minute we'll roll. So this is week two of our study, Escaping the Lion's Den. And I just review briefly the, 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 the backdrop or the, the context of our current lives is this. We feel like in some ways we are in the lion's den of existence right now. Maybe you're cooped up at home and you've been there for, since March. Um, it's just been a weird year. 2020. And it's best represented in a quote that I read a couple of weeks ago, uh, a quote by a Sonoma, California county official. The story of her life is she is now losing the, her second home to a wildfire in three years. And she said this, quote, it feels like God has no sympathy, no empathy for Sonoma County. And maybe that's you. Maybe you feel numb. Uh, maybe you feel like God just isn't listening. He's not very sympathetic. It's okay to admit that even the little disappointments in 2020 are a big deal to me. Even the little disappointments, they're a big deal to you. And, and therefore, I would say they matter to God. They matter to our Heavenly Father as well. Uh, for instance, maybe you're a high school, high school senior and, and you haven't even had the opportunity to set foot on campus. Maybe you're an athlete and you're playing your game, your sport, in an empty stadium. Nothing feels right this year, the year of COVID. That's the backdrop of our lives. It's been a tough year. The backdrop of the Bible stories that we're studying in the book of Daniel, the backdrop is this, 70 straight tough years in the history of a nation, in the, in the history of, of the nation of Israel. Uh, it began around 586 B.C. and it lasted for about 70 years and they were captives. They were captives in a foreign land, first Babylonia, then Persia. But this first, this first uh, nation that, 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 that captured them, Babylonia, the, the, the king that we read about is King Nebuchadnezzar. And in these dark times, uh, the Lord speaks an odd message to his people. In Jeremiah 29, he says this, you work for the peace and the prosperity of, of, of Babylon. That's their captor. It seemed like they should hate Babylon. He says, he says, pray to the Lord for that city where you are held captive, for if Babylon has peace, so will you. And the Lord makes this promise to the nation of Israel, to the Jews, his children. He says, I am disciplining you, but I'm not destroying you. I am disciplining you in love. I am not destroying you in anger. I'm not abandoning you. That's what the Lord says when the nation of Israel is going through 70 tough years. And, and that's the Lord's message to us today. Uh, he's not abandoning us. And that's the story that we find in the book of Daniel, in today's, in today's specific Bible story. The, the, the book of Daniel, um, five-week study, uh, and, and the main character, uh, Daniel, he's, he's a special young man. He's about 15 years of age when he is uh, captured and hauled off to Babylon, hauled off into exile, uh, and he has three or three buddies that we read about: Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, Daniel survives three kings um, during this exile, uh, and he was chosen along with his three buddies: Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He was chosen uh, to serve King Nebuchadnezzar in the court. Uh, all four of them as advisors to the court. And then they had their own levels of responsibility throughout the land in this foreign land. So they were esteemed by God to lead uh, under King Nebuchadnezzar, this foreign king under his rule. 
Uh, and so we read over the next several weeks in the, story, in, in the stories of Daniel, we read, of, we read about how he interpreted dreams, how he watched his friends escape a fiery furnace, like a really hot pizza oven. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we read about how uh, Daniel escaped the lion's den that comes in a few weeks. He receives divine prophetic uh, words from the Lord. All these sort of grand, uh, uh, exciting stories, but the overarching theme, the overall theme in this whole study, the recurring theme throughout is God's sovereignty over human affairs. In other words, God rules, uh, he is in control, he is powerful over all human affairs, even the disappointments. So this is week two, and we are studying about the, the story of the fiery furnace. The fiery furnace. Again, think of a, a pizza oven so hot that it can cook a pizza in, a, in seven minutes, and so big that you can cram four human beings into the oven. That's what we're talking about today, the fiery furnace. A little backdrop. One sin, that's when we go against the will and the favor of the Lord. One sin that shows up as a theme in the Old Testament, it shows up as a theme in the New Testament. One sin, it shows up throughout church history, it shows up in American history uh, again, again, and again. It's a sin that thrives in, current, uh, in our current mainstream cultural environment. Uh, one sin, it is the worship of idols. The worship of idols. In Exodus 20, the Lord lays the groundwork very early on in human history. He says this, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. And what is this little g God, the God that, 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 that our Heavenly Father is speaking of? What is, what is this idol, this, this little g God, what is this little idol? Uh, and and, and are, we, are we the church, are we tempted by idols? And do we, as a church, do we have any idols? Do I, as a pastor, do you have any idols in your life, in my life? And the answer is, of course, yes. And it's, it is an immensely big deal. Idols in, our, in, in my life, in your life, it's, it's a big deal. And we, the church, we don't talk about it enough. And, and your idols, they're, they're keeping you at arm's length from God. You need to know that. We need to realize the significance of idols in our lives. So that's what we're talking about today. Let's, let's jump right in. Uh, now, now, we're reading uh, Daniel chapter 3. Briefly, here's the, here's the story. King Nebuchadnezzar builds a huge gold statue, like 90 feet tall and uh, 9 feet wide. And he orders everyone in the kingdom to, to bow down and worship this large 90 foot tall golden idol. All right, it says this, And all the officials of the provinces gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and they stood before the image that, that, that the king had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You were commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of these instruments, the horn, the pipe, the tire, the trigon, the harp, the bagpipe, and every kind of music, you were to fall down and worship the golden image that King Nebuchadnezzar set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Again, a fiery furnace, think a large, industrial-sized pizza oven. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. And they said this, they said, You, O king, have made a decree uh, and there are certain Jews 
whom you have appointed over the, uh, the affairs of the providence of Babylon. He's talking about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these men, O king, they pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods, little g, or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then, then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they, they brought these men before the king, and the king answered, uh, uh, answered and said to them, Is it true uh, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you are ready, when you hear... The sound of the, the instruments, um, the music. If you're ready to fall down and worship the image that I have made, well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into the burning, fiery furnace. And, and who is the God, little g, who will deliver you out of my hands? Um, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they answered. They said to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you. In this matter, um, if this be so, our God whom we serve, he's able to deliver us from the fiery furnace, um, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, uh, be it known, O king, that we will not serve your gods, we will not worship the golden image uh, that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury. And the expression on his face was changed uh, against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And he, he ordered the furnace heated seven times uh, more than it was usually heated. And he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men, the ones who threw them into the fire, the, the guards, uh, they were... Uh, I'm sorry, then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their garments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because of the king's order, because it was so urgent and the furnace was so hot, it was overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the, the guards. Uh, and these three men uh, fell bound into the fiery furnace. Then the king, he was astonished, and he rose up and, and he, uh, in haste, and, and he declared to the counselors, did we not cast three men into the fire? They answered and said to the king, true, O king. And he answered and said, but I see four men unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth Man is like a son of the gods. The word of the Lord, for which I give thanks. Okay, I, I just I got to get to the main point here. Uh, the the climax of the story is Jesus showed up in the middle of the trauma, in the middle of the drama. Bigger picture, Jesus shows up in the middle of your trauma. Now, let me ask, if these three young men would have simply uh, bowed to the pressure, just said, okay, king, you know, whatever, we'll, we'll do this, what would have happened? Well, well, nothing. Everybody would have just gone on about their normal business. They would have been, been found innocent, and gone back home. God wouldn't have shown up. God wouldn't have needed to show up. Jesus wouldn't have appeared in the fire, wouldn't have needed to. And these three men would be spiritually dead without even feeling any different. When you feel that pressure to, to bow to an idol, you have all the freedom to give in. The Lord won't strike you dead in some sort of miraculous moment. No, you'll go on with life. You'll, you'll, you'll go on living in your spiritual deadness. You might not even realize it. The Lord just lets us go on our spiritually dead ways until it catches up to us. Some of you are living that dull sort of existence right now. But, but in the case of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, it was different. Uh, they looked this temptation in the eye 
Everyone else was bending the knee to the idol. They looked temptation in the eye and they said, we won't bow down. And Jesus showed up. May I suggest that, that the year of COVID has shed light on the idols in my life, the idols in your life. You see, an idol, it's something that when taken away from me causes me deep distress, causes me deep dissatisfaction. It's something that when taken away from me might be a freedom, might be an object, might be an opportunity. When, it, when it's taken away, then there's fighting in my life. There's strife in my life. That thing, that thing that, that when taken away creates such strife, that's an idol. May I suggest some, some idols that are pretty common in America today and therefore pretty common, unfortunately, in the church today. The first one that I see, there's some similarity between this and, and the story of, of Babylon, King and King uh, Nebuchadnezzar. The first American idol that I see is the idol of patriotism. Patriotism. There are those of us uh, who love this country and are appalled by the current direction that we're headed in. There are some of us who, who love this country and, and we, uh, we believe we're on the, finally on the right course uh, as a country. But there's just a vision. There, there's this wholesale, uh, this wholesale uh, fighting and, and bickering and, 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 and tension regarding patriotism and what it ought to look like in my life, in your life. It looks one way in this person's life, one way in that person's life, and it has become an idol, the idol of patriotism. It has caused strife and division and Jesus has always said, I will be king of kings and I will be lord of lords, but you guys seem to have chosen a different king. I won't be that kind of king, Jesus says. The, the wars that rage uh, in us, in our, in our culture, we see it in the book of James where it says this, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? The, the idol of patriotism. Patriotism is a good thing, but, but when it becomes the ultimate thing in my life, the one thing that I live for, it becomes an idol. And Jesus says, I, I won't be that kind of king. He never intended to be. Uh, another Another idol that I see uh, very, very common in our country right now is exhibitionism. It's not a word that you probably use real often, but it means this. Extravagant behavior intended to attract attention to myself. Sometimes it's immodesty, sometimes it's showing off, but exhibitionism. Always drawing attention to myself, wanting to be the center Wanting to be, and sometimes, and sometimes it, again, it takes on an immodest sort of a life unto itself. I watched for a few minutes uh, this past week, I watched uh, the Billboard Music Awards. Uh, and John Legend sang a beautiful song to his wife, Chrissy. Uh, I watched uh, Bad Bunny do his hip hop uh, routine in Spanish and then received his Billboard Music Award in English. And I love, you know this about me, I love culture, I love art, I love, I love music, I love contemporary scenes. But we must admit, admit that, that exhibitionism, extravagant behavior intended to attract attention, showing off, and immodesty, we have to admit that that, that is worshipped in today's culture. It's... It's a high priority. 1 Thessalonians 4 calls Christians to a very different lifestyle. It says this, Make it your goal to live a quiet life, minding your own business and, and working with your hands, just as we instructed you before. I mean, I'm sorry, exhibitionism. It's the second idol that I see pretty prevalent, even in the church. A third idol, this may, all, all of these may really surprise you, 
uh, that I would call them idols. The third is family. Family's a good thing. You know, and, and, and for most of us, either family's really working out well, such that we've made it the highest priority, uh, and, and we, we worship the family, and if anything would ever happen to the family unit, we would curse God because it's, it's become too important. Or, or for some of us, family just isn't working out. Uh, and so it's, 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 it's just the greatest pain in my life, in your life, and we're just waiting for this great turnaround. Um, but family, for some of us, have, has become a God, even too important. A fourth idol that I see is the idol of comfort. I tell you, it's hard, to motiv- it's hard to motivate a comfortable bunch of people to do uncomfortable and courageous things. Let me say that again. This is sort of a, the pastor's mantra. It is really hard to motivate a comfortable bunch of people to do uncomfortable and courageous things. I really see this as being Jesus' biggest frustration. Uh, he would say, unless you're willing to, to give up land and houses and comfort and follow me, you will have no part in building, the, in building my kingdom. And they would walk away because their things were too important. Comfort was too important. Jesus would say, but, but if you give up things for my sake, you'll be rewarded 100 fold. And yet we settle for less. We settle for comfortable. We settle for, for a, a second bathroom addition. Yeah. Yeah. A, a, a bathroom in the garage, right? A, a new swimming pool. And Jesus offers us big time life of adventure for eternity. And we settle for small potato idols. I suppose maybe we just don't really believe Jesus. The last idol that I see in the American church would be the idol of materialism. The basic belief that that what's most important in this life is accruing wealth and and spending um, another nauseating day searching the internet for that perfect backpack or iPhone or, or whatever. The, that, that, the, the thing that you think is, is worth spending a whole day surfing the net over, that would be an idol. That's what that is. Like I might ask, uh, have you ever thought of, of living your life totally devoted to the adventure that Jesus is calling you to? What do you think that might look like? And then you might say, yeah, yeah, but you know, but I just noticed that on Friday the iPhone 12 is coming out. And, and it's like we're talking two different languages. Because we are a people within the church who chase after idols. And why are these idols so bad? Because they take attention off Jesus. Why are these idols so bad? Because many in the church, some of us, Today, who think we are Christians, um, we actually, we have a different agenda. We're, we're living for a different purpose. Like we have a very different playbook than Jesus does. And Jesus told this parable, you remember it, about the farmer who sowed seeds. And he sowed uh, seed on an asphalt road and the birds came and ate it. He sowed his, he threw his seeds down, planted his seeds on rocky soil. I don't know why I did this, but on rocky soil and, and the plants grew a little and then they died because of the heat of the sun. He, he, threw, he threw some seeds where thorns were and the thorns choked out the baby plants and then, and then, he, then he planted some seeds on good soil and it, it reproduced richly. And, and, and then Jesus later explains and he says, here's the deal. Some of these seeds that fell on bad soil, the rocks or the thorns or the, or the road, uh, they represent people whose idol is, is the fear of persecution or, or discomfort. Like for a little while you follow Jesus, but then you're like, ah, 
But he, the church asks too much. I don't want to be uncomfortable here. Nobody wants to be uncomfortable here. Or, or, or the idol, Jesus speaks of the cares of the world. The cares of the world. I, I got to go take care of business. I, I got to go to softball practice. I got to take my kids to soccer. Or, or, or the, the deceitfulness of wealth. I, I got to make a living. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta go make, uh, I gotta go make retirement. And, and and Jesus says all of those idols, the the the, the seed that falls on the on the ground but never sprouts up. It's it's people that they never they never ultimately follow Jesus because of the idols in their life. Only the good soil in that parable represents the Christian. All the others, they're idol worshipers. They fall away. They bow down. They give up. So what I want to do here, um, briefly, because I think you, you get the point. What I want to do here briefly is, in this next section, talk about the big ideas. Where do we go from here? The big ideas found in this teaching. Big idea number one. Idols will never satisfy in fact, I would invite you, show me someone who has finally and eternally found idols in this life to, to be deeply satisfying. And I'll stop preaching this message. But I've just not seen it. I've not seen anyone ever ultimately find satisfaction in idols. And certainly the story of the Bible is such. Everyone who chases after idols, throughout the history of the Bible, they, they run into brick walls. They, they find in devastating ways dissatisfaction until Jesus shows up and they find rest in him. Big idea number two is this. Idol worshipers are not true worshipers. They're not followers of God. Idol worshipers are painted, the picture of them, they're painted as the opposite of, of a Christian, a Christ follower. Big idea number three is this. Jesus can be the object of my affection. You know, I... I, I was just talking with my, my daughter. They're, they're studying school. They're studying the, his, the his, historic, uh, the history of religion, and, and they were, they're looking at deism. And, and deism is this picture that God is far off, and he's aloof. He's like a watchmaker. He just sets up the watch, and, and then it just runs, and he, he steps back and just lets it all happen. That is not the God of the Bible. This distant, far-off, aloof God who does not permeate your existence who does not get involved that's not the god of the bible the god of the bible is the one who jumps into the fire with you uh, he's not just some far off careless god in fact he's not that at all he's an imminent god he's a god who who takes part in your life he's a god who walks through the fire with you jesus he can be the object of your affection this is why Jesus promises rest in him alone. He's the only God. The God of the Bible is the only God who says, Come to me, everyone who is heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take, take this new load, this new yoke upon you. It's easy. It, it fits well. Find rest in Jesus. Jesus can be the object of my affection. That is why he shows up in the torment of the fire. Don't you see that? Jesus, in the middle of the fire with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what he's saying for that, for that day and for the rest of human history, what he's saying to us is, look at me, I walk through the fire with you. You do go through fire. I walk with you. And the big idea number four is this. The Lord's fighting for me. The, the Lord's fighting for you. At this very moment. 
in this tough year. I, I've come to realize that, that most people, I mean, as a pastor, I hang around with a lot of people, and over the course of the several decades of being a pastor, I suppose almost 30 decades, of, or three decades, 30 years of being a pastor, I've been a lot of people, and I realize most people, they're just astonishingly bored with life. Maybe that's you right now. Just really bored. And yet we keep going back to the same old idols. Thinking something will be different this time. What I invite you to do this morning is, is, is evaluate. Take stock. All the things that are, that are idols in your life. That, that you're chasing after. They're the objects of your affection. What if today you said, Jesus calls me to, to be a risk taker. Jesus calls me to, to a, a, an uncomfortable, courageous way of living. Jesus calls me to, to make him the object of my affection. What if, what if, you, what if you tried that? What if, what if you took him at his word? What did the young men say that day? They said, even if God doesn't deliver us from this fire at this moment in time, King, we, we, we're still not bowing down. Why? Because they knew that there was a bigger picture. That God had, a, had not only a, a great adventure in their life for the next 70 years, he had an eternal destiny. He had a great eternal adventure, and they trusted that that was much bigger, much greater than these idols that everyone else around them was chasing after. Think on all that means for them. Think on all that means for you. God has this great eternal destiny in store for you if you'll follow him and not your idols. If, you will, if you'll focus your affection on Jesus and not your idols. That's my prayer for you today, my friend. Amen. I invite you now to the table of communion. On the night that Jesus was to be betrayed, he held up the bread and he held up the cup and he said, from now on when you do this, do this remembering me. Jesus took the bread and he broke it and he gave thanks and he and his disciples ate of it and he said, this is my body broken for the forgiveness of your sins. And Jesus took the cup and he held it up and he blessed it and he and his disciples drank from it and he said, this is my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. From now on when you do this, Jesus said, do this remembering me. And that's what we do today, 2,000 years later. We remember that, that, that Jesus... He is the, the key. He is the hub. He is the, the centerpiece. He is our Lord and our Savior. And so we run to him. We, we lean on him. We trust his work on the cross. We celebrate his death, burial, and resurrection today. So I invite you right there in the privacy of your own home, break the bread and drink from the cup. And in so doing, celebrate Jesus. Well, friends, that's a wrap uh, for the day. I want to thank you again for inviting me into your home and, and making me a part of your Sunday worship. If you need anything and you'd like to contact the elders or contact me personally here at River Church, send me an email, randy at riverchurchrgv.com, randy at riverchurchrgv.com. And if there's any way that we can serve you, we would love to do so. If you want to find out how you might get connected or more connected, uh, to our church, send me an email or go to our website, riverchurchrgv.com, and you'll see we've got online prayer gatherings. We've got ways for you to get connected virtually, uh, even though you're still staying at home at this point. Uh, if you're ready, when you're ready, we now have resumed public worship here in the building on Sunday mornings at 11 a.m., so I'd love to see you, there, see you uh, here as soon as you can get back. Now would be a good time to give. You can go online and, and give a website. You go there, uh, riverchurchrgv.com, and, and you can give. It's simple. It's, uh, it's intuitive. It's safe. It's kind of fun. 
Um, everything we do here is based on uh, relying on your good gifts. So, so go there and you can be a and you can give in that way. Well, uh, I love you guys. Uh, it's been good to be with you. I continue to pray for you throughout the week. Enjoy the rest of your day.